The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. This is Curtis Bernstein. I'm the Managing Director of Evaluation Services for Altegra Health. I want to welcome everyone to our webinar today. I am co-presenting with Blaine Rush. Blaine is the President. Uh, he's an investment banker with Ambulatory Alliances. He provides services in the urgent care, surgery center, radiation oncology, and other healthcare spaces. Today's webinar is on preparing to sell your urgent care under urgent care business for its maximum price and terms in 2015 and 16. We'll spend the next hour going over various uh, information such as understanding when is a good time and bad time to sell your business, what you can do to improve your strengths and weaknesses, um, or take advantage of your strengths and improve on your weaknesses, how to improve, how to look for red flags when you're selling your business as well. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Blaine, who's going to get into um, the life cycle of the business. Yeah, thanks, Curtis, and I appreciate everybody uh, taking time to uh, join us this morning. And, you know, urgent care businesses and businesses in general, urgent care market, financial markets, et cetera, all have life cycles. You know, um, you know, I've, I grow some fruit trees, so... I have some land I own. I probably got about 30 or so fruit trees, peaches, apples, pecans, plums, pears, etc. And the cycles of those fruit trees are well uh, recognized. They sprouted, they grew, they flowered. Those flowers turn into fruit. I've harvested them. My, uh, I, I find once I harvest that I got a lot of friends that come over and eat eat that fruit, but um, those, uh, you know, those trees have a very definitive life cycle. You know, the, 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 the flowers, they wither, they die, decay, enrich the soil to support the next year cycle producing more fruit. You know, you and I have a life cycle. As in life, businesses, like I said, market segments, they all have a life cycle. The urgent care business and the overall, so your urgent care business, overall urgent care market and the financial markets, those are the cycles that we're going to talk about and the patterns of each. These life cycles are a little less recognized than the fruit trees and within our lives, but understanding those will help you understand the most often asked question, you know, when is the best time to sell my business? The um, the stages of those um, of the life cycles of a business are fairly consistent. There's the startup, there's initial growth, there's rapid growth, slowing growth, plateau, and decline. The amount of time that you spend and occupy each one of those stages depends on numerous factors. You know, it depends on your ability to speed through a phase such as initial growth, growth. Um, or the expanding or prolong a phase such as the rapid growth phase through what's called reverse positioning your business. And what that means, so what reverse positioning means is making changes to the business such as adding a center, merging with a competitor, expanding services, etc. Therefore, repositioning your business, you know, so you go back for rapid growth or expansion. You know, so we'll describe a little bit about <clears throat> these stages. So the startup is the pre-development phase where you're trying to figure out what direction you want to go, how you're going to get there, et cetera. And then you have the initial growth phase, which is a very important stage in your center's development towards profitability. This is when you set the tone, you lay the foundation, and you're aggressively marketing the center and you're marketing the staff, the providers, et cetera. Patient are, um, you know, they have their first impression of you guys. They have the first impression of the operation of the center, et cetera. Profits more than likely will not be there until you um, cover the fixed costs. We all know what the fixed costs are. And in this part of the, the development, you should be focused on working with your marketing team, referral partners to capture the patient volume that you put in your performance. You want to work to uh, improve operational efficiencies and contain costs. 
Uh, if you're not seeing the projected patient volume that you've put in those performance, you need to address it now. I've seen a lot of people, you know, think, oh, build it and it's going to come. It doesn't happen like that. So you need to be working towards breaking even as quickly as possible. You know, and that being said, you should look to see where you, when you need to be open, how many hours a day, uh, you know, have minimal staffing to cover. I've seen people put two providers in there and, and one's doing nothing while the, while the other's seeing a couple of patients. And so you need to pay attention to that. Obviously, you need to contain costs without sacrificing the patient experience. I've seen some centers that are two years or, or so old that are not out of the stage of development. Again, there's very few locations, and especially now, that, that has a build it and they'll come <clears throat> type location. You've got to be putting in a lot of work. During the rapid growth stage, you're covering the fixed costs, have worked out some of the operational inefficiencies, taking care of the patients, and have developed some brand missionaries, and those are the patients that love you, et cetera, and are out there telling everybody about you. They're promoting you in the marketplace. And you're becoming profitable. You're becoming consistently or more consistently profitable. Your EBITDA is expanding with each added patient once all the fixed costs is covered, right? During this um, expanded growth phase, this is where the fun begins. Everything that you work towards moves fast. You've, uh, your hard work and your strategic operations are paying off. The results are there. The, um, the profits are being driven by taking care of your patients. Referrals are coming in. And you continue to market, and uh, you're thinking about expanding. It's possible that the uh, slow growth phase happens at any time in an urgent care's business life cycle. But most likely it occur after you captured most of the low-hanging fruit type patients, and if you slow the marketing or the patient acquisition activities, however you define that. Um, this phase is when the growth slows down, the excitement's gone, Best practices sometimes are overlooked. Cost containment aren't looked at as well because, hey, I've been out there making a lot of money. People lose sight of, of the things that, that got them there. It, you know, people are looking and for, uh, forgetting about the fundamentals, and they think that the rapid growth stage is never going never gonna, to uh, end, never going to slow down. And then you have the plateau stage of your urgent care business, you know, sometimes you're having challenges, everything's stalled, you know, the, uh, the staff are getting complacent. And obviously during the decline stage, as the name suggests, your center's in a state of decline. Patients are going elsewhere. Well, the overall urgent care business, or, um, urgent care market rather, has a similar life cycle, but obviously different stages, uh, they have different stage attributes. Um, at the as the market begins to mature, you'll see con consolidation start to increase, and you start to see different models uh, be implemented as well as expanded services. I think we all understand that the financial markets are very uh, slick, cyclical. Um, equity and debt make up the capital markets. Any business requires some form of capital in order to fund its growth and expand its foothold. Debt costs significantly less than equity. The bigger the company, the easier it is to obtain debt or get loans. The larger the company, the larger the lever leverageability. So um, the, the smaller transactions do not typically know that the company is using debt to buy their business, but many times there's a parent company level debt that's used. It, you know, and why all this is important, so we talked about the three different life cycles, and we only hit on the uh, life cycle of the market and the life cycle of the financial markets. You know, but this is important because you need to have an understanding of all three in order to maximize your exit or take on capital partners for expansion. You know, I know a lot of owners think that they should ride their business until it's not going any longer or it's declining or when they're ready to retire. Um, not to get into some of the future answers, but you don't want to make that mistake. You know, you don't want to wait until you've maximized your profit and put everything in your pocket and you can't figure out where to uh, get more growth 
or that you're ready to retire. You need to remember that buyers, is, are, they are buying the future. Most buyers want to see that there's still some growth opportunity. So they're looking at, hey, 75% uh, 70, up that growth curve. If you're a one to three or four center business, you want to sell when the, more, uh, the market is north of the middle of the rapid growth phase. Because this is when there's very, a very competitive landscape, an overall positive industry outlook, and there's significant market demand. The early people have gotten into the market. The market understands the business. And this is when the most buyers are in the market. The point is, in the middle of the upper end of the rapid growth stage of the urgent care market is when the largest group of new, new people have entered. There, there are more people presenting themselves as buyers. There's new money or equity entering the space. Thus, the most competition, which drives up price. Couple that when the debt markets are cheap and easy and you have a great landscape to sell your business. Because again, the lower cost of capital and the more buyers in the market means the more that a buyer can pay for your business. No different than the real estate market. You know, housing prices go significantly up when the loans and mortgages are uh, cheap and easy. So essentially the best time to sell is when uh, when you have the most uh, bargaining power. That's when you still have some growth, you still have some gas in your personal tank, meaning that they want you typically to stay on some form or fashion most of the time, and there's plenty of buyers, new buyers are entering the market, and the financial markets are, are, are good. And I believe that you know, by the end of 2016, that the vast majority of the financial, mar uh, financial buyers that are open to considering some of the smaller platforms will uh, have their full, you know, so they have, have gotten into the market or they will have gotten out of being interested in the market. So if you're a smaller platform, you know, by, I don't know if it's going to be, you know, towards the end of 2016 or early 2017, but we're going to see that those guys are uh, no longer going to be open to consider the smaller platforms because they'll have already gotten their full we'll see still a significant number of the one to four center types aligned with management companies' health, health systems over the next few years. And they'll still have a very attractive multiples. You know, the, the financial markets are very, very good right now. Debt's cheap. So um, uh, it, it's, it's a very good time for those smaller platforms. And we'll see this, the, the one, two, three, four centers, they'll still have a, a lot of life for the next you know, eight years, but um, it, it's it's still a good time. Curtis, thank you, Blaine. Uh, next question we're gonna get to: Is there a bad time to sell urgent care center? So, going off what Blaine was saying, obviously the best time is during the growth section. There, I would say there really is not a, a worse time to sell it because there's a a reason to sell it as you're as you're going through. Um, for example, you may not want to sell it during the rapid growth phase because you want to continue to earn as much money as possible off the urgent care center as as the urgent care center continues to grow, and you can do that without a a um, a private investor, you know, if you so choose. But obviously, then you are if you do try to sell it later. Uh, in the decline phase when if you're in a position you're looking to retire. Uh, as Blaine mentioned, you're not going to get the same level of multiples. So going through the life cycle here on the slide, you know, we can go through the different phases and it doesn't make sense to to sell an interest at startup. And if you're if you're a single physician, let's say, and you want to start an urgent care center and maybe you don't have the funding available to you and you can bring in a private investor to make that happen, then I, you know, you have to guess, sell sell a startup is the best time to sell. Definitely not, because at the end of the day, when you start up an entity, the way the ownership is going to be divided is based on what it takes to actually develop the entity. So there's going to be certain costs to build out space, maybe buy space, buy equipment, initial working capital to take on staff as you are not collecting on your receivables, 
and there's a certain amount that will take it'll take to create that entity and let's just call that for simplicity's sake two million dollars if you're selling a 50 percent interest to a private owner and all that private owner is going to put in right now for that 50 percent interest is one million dollars so half of the two million dollars and they're going to get 50 percent you're obviously not capitalizing on that investment at that time because there hasn't been any track record of success and growth. So that private investor will get a lot higher return if the entity uh, is successful and grows through through these different phases. Um, as Blaine mentioned, the rapid growth period obviously is the best time to settle because there's a lot of excitement and, and opportunity out in the market and that's what buyers are looking for. And if you have the earnings, they'll pay the higher multiple. As as the entity starts to plateau, you may need to bring in a new owner to to create more of that motivation and excitement and back into the market, whether it's a new position or it's a partner that might be able to work with plans and bring in new insurance plans into the urgent care center and better reimbursement rates, whatnot. But but as you hit that plateau, similar to the line here, just the, the life cycle, it's kind of the multiples as well. The multiples are going to start to, to settle down and plateau. Uh, but, you know, like I said at the beginning, I don't think there's really a, a worse time because you may have a reason and a need to, to sell at a certain time as you're going through that, that cycle. Did you have anything to add to that plane before we move on to the next question? Well, the only point to add is, you know, because we're at a point where there's a lot of centers going up in, in certain geographies. And one of the challenges could be, say that your center is just up the road from another center, and that center gets acquired. It, you know, so my, my whole point is, yes, you could, if, if your interest is to maximize your exit, meaning the dollar amount paid to you, when you sell, you have to just be uh, be looking at all of the different important items. Uh, and obviously, like Curtis said, sometimes you just have to sell, but that's not necessarily the best time to sell. So I don't know if the the right question really is: Is there a bad time to sell? It's probably just uh, there's probably better times to sell. I guess that's the only point that I'd make. Um, how do I put together a team of advisors and who should be on that team? I'll speak to a little bit about that. Um, obviously, urgent care, business owners, physician operators, you know, people that have uh, owned three or four or five of these are very intelligent, very accomplished. You know, but typically speaking, most of these owner operators are only going to complete one or two transactions in the course of a lifetime. But typically, those deals will be the largest and most significant financial transaction of their careers. So by definition, there's some inexperience there. And that can prove challenging as people negotiate with a buyer's full-time professional M&A team. Because all the buyers have those guys. I say all of them, 99% of them, have a well-seasoned, experienced team that's done this over and over. They get up and do it every morning. And there's a lot of implications, such as legal, taxes, that type of stuff, not to mention the negotiation strategies and the business structure implications. You know, so it's very important to have no different than the different uh, that, that you had advisors, I'm confident, during the different phases of the, of the urgent care business's development, that you put together a team of transaction advisors if no more to show you how to plan up front, you know, what to look for, et cetera. And, and I'm going to, uh, I guess, go through a list of people that you should consider. You don't necessarily, it depends on the size of the transaction and complexity of the deal. But here, here's some of the types of people like transaction accountants, your business accountant, transaction lawyers, industry-specific investment bankers, you want key, uh, key members of your management team, Valuation professional. If you're a larger group or, uh, group of owners, then I always recommend putting together a transaction committee or a point person that is empowered empowered by the group of owners to make decisions. Because you know, just for 
relevance, say you have 20 owners, well, you don't have to run around getting um, approval from 20, 20 people because that could be a nightmare. And, and as we'll talk soon about what kills deals, you'll see that that, that, that has the potential for killing a deal. But let's speak uh, briefly about the whys behind each, each uh, type of person and their roles. So accountant and transaction accountant, they might be the same person, Many times they're not. It's important that you seek out an accountant with significant experience with uh, business transfers. Uh, you need to have one, or these are the types of questions, or get an understanding from your current accountant, that if they understand the different methods that you can transfer the business and the tax consequences of each. Yeah, I'm not just talking about asset versus stock sale, but the larger business, the larger the business, the more thought that needs to go into this. Should you create a trust? Other questions like that. Your current accountant might be that person, but then again, it might not be the person. You know, do they understand the tax consequences around the allocation of the sales price, personal goodwill, business goodwill? You know, when and into what type of entity you should receive the funds? You know, should you create a trust to receive those? Those are the types of things that that. Uh, person would understand. You know, uh, investment bankers understand tax implication, deal structures, etc., because of experience and whatnot, but those things get into the weeds and you really need someone that's very specialized in those areas. You know, it's, it's very possible that you have a healthcare lawyer or attorney that you call on often. You need to make sure that you have an attorney on your team that is very experienced with urgent care business transfers and the associated deal documents, the legal implications. And more importantly, and sometimes this is overlooked, the temperament to make sure that the deal does not stall because they want to debate an issue that's not very important. There, um, you know, there's a lot of contracts and terms such as warrants and reps, uh, demonification clauses, insurance requirements, you know, transitional service agreement. Then you have the Stark, the any kickback, et cetera, all those types of very specific health care uh, laws that you have to uh, follow. And, and so this is, very, uh, this is more important than most people understand. You know, the, the lawyer that just defended you in a lawsuit or your wife's cousin that set up your will and estate planning, you know, that might not be the best person for this role. Um, <laughs> industry-specific investment bankers. You know, the ones that have experience and are complex, they understand the process of preparing, preparing your business all the way to funding. So they understand it end to end. They understand valuation issues. They understand uh, tax issues. They understand legal structure and how best to position your business and to manage the process uh, and to negotiate with the, the buyer's deal teams. You know, it's uh, they understand the, the urgent care business down into the weeds. Typically, they know the market, they know the buyers, they know the decision makers within the buyers, and uh, it's very important that that you prepare your business uh, and your business mindset, and they they will help you. Um, they understand the red flags, they understand the pitfalls, and they understand them before they come up. So they'll be able to prepare and say, "Hey, this is going to happen." You need to prepare for that because these things um, these things die. So deal dies 200 times from hello to funding, you know, and 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 there's all kinds of pitfalls. So you need to at least seek some advice uh, out there. Uh, you'll need someone from your senior operations team. That person is going to obviously know what's going on, so you need to be someone you trust very deeply because they'll be responsible for putting together the due diligence because there is a significant amount of due diligence, and we'll speak about that in a little bit, that, that will have to be collected and shared at the right time. And again, if you have a large group of physician owners, it's important that you get their buy-in, uh, but it's too time-consuming to get permission from each partner every step of the process. Thus, again, we recommend setting up a small transaction committee that's empowered. Obviously, if you are if just one or two owners, that's the, 
the, that's the transaction committee. Um, third party evaluation uh, professionals. You know, the majority of the time, and Curtis can speak more to this, but the buyers would be the person that engage a evaluator. Uh, but if you're doing some complex business adjustments prior to the sale of the center, um, and depending on the buyer and how the negotiations goes, you might have a need for a third-party valuation in order to justify the prices negotiated. And, and we know we do that, so we understand valuation, but we're advocates. We're seen as an advocate for the seller, and third-party evaluators are just that. They're supposed to be impartial, third-party, et cetera. And, um, you know, like Curtis, and he can speak more to that. But you can, the way you go about finding these professionals, you know, you can read industry-specific articles. I mean, we publish a lot of articles on the, um, the Ambulatory M&A Advisor. Uh, you can go to healthcaretransactionlawyers.com, healthcare evaluators, call Curtis, call myself, that type of stuff. You know, just network, and you'll you'll be able to find the people that that are uh, that do this often. Curtis, you have anything to to add? Yeah, the main point uh, on the on the valuation side, the thing we we've been seeing a little bit more of is entities being sold in corporate practice and medicine states. And so if it's a physician-led entity, it may be set up as a single entity uh, where it's just one urgent care center, for example. And you may have a need to break out the management service organization from the professional service organization. And you, know, you may have the sale of that, and then the management service organization provides services back to the, the professional services organization, and that has to be at fair market value. And that, you know, for example, one way a valuation expert might be able to help uh, with a certain transaction. To, to Blaine's point on due diligence, his question is, what is due diligence and what should I expect? And from the, I guess from the valuation and the broker side, and Blaine can talk more, you know, we'll generally do a limited, what I consider limited due diligence. A lot of the stuff we request that the seller represent um, that, that certain things may exist or there's not challenges to the existence such as ownership of the fixed assets within the entity you know who who owns that is there a loan on them is, uh, is there a lien on the fixed assets is there a lien on the business uh, through some kind of debt covenant and we're going to assume that there there isn't or we'll ask someone to represent that from the due diligence perspective, uh, and even from Blaine's perspective, Blaine's going to pull uh, the loan agreements and look for those types of things. And then the buyer will generally have their own due diligence team as well, who will look at those documents as the transaction goes forward, uh, usually after there's already a letter of intent in place so that the transaction has moved far enough along that they that both parties are comfortable that they're going to go through with the actual sale and purchase, uh, they will they will have all those documents and pull it. And there's going to be a whole team usually, uh, depending on the size of the entity and and the scope uh, of the entity. But there will be a whole team on the buyer side that performs due diligence. So, for example, financial due diligence from the valuation perspective. We assume income statements are fairly clean. We like to use tax returns uh, because at least we know a CPA has looked at it prior to filing it with the IRS, and you hope when you file it with the IRS that they're not fraudulent. I mean, that obviously, there's no guarantee to that. But from the buyer's perspective, they'll generally have their internal accountants um, look at the financial statements or do some level of, of a audit or review of those financial statements to verify that they're reasonable. Various areas within the financial statement such as uh, human resource and benefits, seeing, making sure that the, the benefits of all the employees of the entity being purchased uh, can continue and if they're going over to the benefits of the buyer, what that looks like ultimately as part of the sale. Uh, the payer contracts are those transferable? If you're, you know, this 
probably, I haven't really seen this apply to an urgent care center, but you know, if you're in a certificate of need type state, is that certificate of need transferable, more applicable on surgery centers and other areas of, of health care. So there's going to be a whole lot of different um, people involved in, in the due diligence team from the buyer perspective. They're going to require a lot of documents. Usually there's a data room set up. All the documents are downloaded. And then the due diligence team will ask a whole lot of questions, uh, even more than generally are asked in, in the valuation. And the broker will probably have a lot of that already prepared and ready. Um, someone might claim. Um, and if not, then, then there'll be questions with management as the process goes forward. Blaine, anything else to add on to that? Yeah, because there's a couple of, so in the beginning, we will, and the buyers, so we'll ask for a short list. And essentially what we're looking at is is the uh, financials, you know, so how much profit is, so look at the, so we'll ask for the financials for the last year. We'll ask, we want to look into the, the uh, acuity level. You know, say you have 70 patients. Well, that sounds pretty good if we're an urgent care center, right? But what if 40 of them are sports physicals? So they're going to look at for the uh, a list of the top 20 codes and then the percentage of um, of those 70 patients, which one belonged to what, that type of stuff. But, you know, that's just the first glance to say, hey, is this worth taking a deeper look? And then the true due diligence, it is very time consuming and a significant amount of information. It it takes some centers, it's taken up to three months to pull that. And it's not that, hey, somebody's working full time pulling that. It's because, hey, they have the office manager or maybe the billing collection pulling all that information. But you go into um you know, let me look at my notes. So you go all the way from the the organizational uh, corporate entity structure, all of the documents associated with that going way back. Financial statements typically going back uh, about three years. You know, the monthly production and the billing reports, case uh, case referral. Um, you know, where they're coming from, where are you getting patients. Where, what are the what are the different codes that you're looking at? They want to see all of the asset details, personal hand ca uh, head count, you know, position, salary, salary, uh, hours worked, etc. They will look at all the real estate leases, all of the um, equipment leases, again the corporate material, uh, very very in, de in depth financial information, uh, you know, physician relationships, and all the provider agreements. Um, again, staffing, all of the insurance, all of your liability insurance, health insurance, I want to see your employment manual, uh, all your regulatory type stuff, legal and compliance, joint venture partnerships, et cetera. And to, and to uh, Curtis's point earlier, he said that as evaluator, they will just have you attest that these things are in place and that that's correct, et cetera. A buyer will do the same thing in the transaction documents, and that's where the warrants and reps come in. And they'll want you to say that these things are true to my best uh, knowledge, et cetera, that type of language. But that'll be all in the asset purchase agreement in the different transaction documents. Next question is, how can I determine my competitive differentiators and market opportunities? Uh, so with that, we've got here a hey, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, and something that was created back in the, the 60s and 70s to understand how businesses operate. What you can do is go through here and try to understand. So if you look at it, the top, the strengths, and the weaknesses are really how you operate now. The opportunities and threats are how do you um, either improve, uh, take those strengths, improve on them, use them as within the market, uh, or take your weaknesses, and what are the opportunities uh, out there for you to improve on those. The threats are, okay, I have this strength, but there's something out, else out in the market that might be happening that can threaten uh, that strength, and then 
obviously weaknesses and threats if they're combined together, that's the worst part for your business. So example of you know the strengths as as Blaine mentioned earlier, you, another another urgent care center might be forming somewhere uh, within your market. And if you're let's say your physician practice and you have an urgent care center and there's a very strong health system with a very good reputation and name within your market, they may be creating an urgent care center and they may have their name on that urgent care center and the patients within the market may see that uh, just just because the affiliation with the name, whether it's a better center uh, clinically or not, ultimately they you know patients may think of it as a better center clinically just because it has that that large name in the market and and that reputation. But you may have had that strength of being the only urgent care center, but now you have this threat of a new competitor coming in the market. So you need to analyze that as you're kind of going through this process and say, okay, well, how do we, how do we go and, and prevent against that? And so that may be back, back all the way to the beginning of the life cycle. Let's say you're in that rapid growth phase, and now you see this threat happening, and you want to either cash out before, or maybe you're saying, well, to the health system, don't go do that. Why don't we work together? and we'll create two, and we'll put the health system's name on ours, and then you can continue with that rapid growth within the market. So a way you know, for you to use this SWOT analysis, and as you kind of go through your, your growth phase and your life cycle, you continue to do this SWOT analysis and make sure that you continue to take advantage of all those, those opportunities that are out there, and make sure that any of the threats that come up are, um, don't obviously affect your business. Um, Weaknesses. So Blaine just gave the great example of you know 70 procedures, but 40 of them being sports uh, medicine. So you need to look at that as you're selling and kind of going through the process and say, well, how do I diversify more? How do I get more cases and become more diversified? And that that will obviously drive up to multiple because when you're a buyer, you don't want if if or let's say they're high school sports physicals and you have an agreement with the high school, well, at the end of the day, if that agreement goes away, then it significantly affects the business of that urgent care center. And from the buyer's perspective, you want to make sure any of those weaknesses um, are, are changed such that they become strengths. So there's more diversification of cases, more, more agreements with different um, whether it's insurance plans or it's, uh, as I mentioned, like high schools or skilled nursing facilities or whatever else it might be within the market. Wayne, did you have anything else you want to add to the question yeah, on so, competitive differentiators? Yeah, so the, the reason behind, so whenever you think of a buyer, so what they want to hear is your, your historical story, your current story, and your future story. They want to come in, so they're not buying based off of, traditionally, they're not buying based off of the money you made yesterday. They're coming in, investing some money to make money in the future. So you have to be able to articulate where the growth is, or it's better if you're able to articulate where the growth is and tell them why you haven't been able to, or the reason that you have not, uh, taking those growth opportunities, meaning that, hey, I don't have the staff, I don't have the expertise, you know, et cetera. So that's kind of why you want to do this is so you can understand how to articulate your growth opportunities to the potential buyer. And, and some of the, one, one of the things that's kind of popular now that I'm dealing with and I'm actually negotiating for a couple of clients and we've written a significant amount of articles on is aligning with an ACO. Uh, essentially, you'll be a provider versus, so you'll be on the outside versus the inside. And you're going to save those guys a significant amount of money. So that's an opportunity if you haven't done that. But to be able to go, once you do this, and say, OK, here's the uh, different entities that I can have a relationship with. So it's an alliance, quote unquote, versus a joint venture or whatnot, that I can improve my my uh, patient volumes through creating some sort of relationship because you're going to make that ACO money by saving them money and keeping their people out of the ER and depends on what other types of services that you do. Uh, I have one client that does uh, infusion centers so they take direct referrals so some of those ACO 
um, uh, docs will refer patients over with ammonia, um, low acuity, uh, COPD, that type of stuff, and they'll give them their meds in their infusion center, keep them out of the hospital, which saves them a lot of money. And another tool that you'll use with this SWOT analysis, because this is a comparative analysis, right? So the uh, Urgent Care Association has their benchmark study. I think it just came out not that long ago. And so you can benchmark yourself against against other other urgent cares in your market, uh, you know, because they might they, they break it down pretty good and nationally, et cetera. See if your contracts are any good, et cetera. We'll get into some of the other things that that you can do uh, whenever we get to the question around what will the buyers do after they buy you, and if you can do some of that stuff before you go to market. So that's all I had to say. With that, we've kind of gone over weaknesses and had determined, so we'll, we'll move on uh, for, for sake of time as well. Well, right, next step, what steps do buyers typically take to improve an urgent care business after a purchase, and how can I do this prior to sale uh, to increase the value? Yeah, so there's... There's a few things that, um, that that buyers can do, and I really didn't know this question was coming right up. I would have just went into it. Um, you know, so what they're going to do is uh, they're going to come in and look at and possibly make adjustments to, uh, for improvements, and they're all related around the value drivers. And more specifically, they'll look for ways to decrease cost, increase revenue, increase efficiencies, obviously working to not jeopardize the patient experience because that's the biggest component of what we do, and uh, not jeopardize patient experience nor the quality of care. You know, but I've seen a lot of these uh, transactions, a lot of books, and done a lot of due diligence on a lot of different urgent care centers across the U.S., and even in the most um, aggressive markets, many owners of urgent care business, they leave some substantial amount of money on the table when they sell their business. You know, most often because they don't truly really have a, a handle on what they can do to maximize the multiplier basis. What that is is the the the, the profits and the multiples, et cetera. Or they don't want to invest required time and effort. But the SWOT analysis will will get you to this stage of understanding this stuff. Um, you know, however the buyers, that's what they're in the business of doing. So they will take the time, they will take the effort to make these changes after they purchase your, your center. So kind of the question to, to ask yourself uh, to be able to answer, should I do it or should I not, is do you want uh, multiple of the, pro the profits derived from the changes that you do, or do you want a buyer to pay you less and earn more post-transaction? -tran post so let's look at a few of these things. So they'll look at the case cost. They'll say, can you reduce the case cost by working with a different vendor, uh, consolidating suppliers, pushing for better pricing, or uh, using different supplies that do, uh, that do not lower quality? You know, and some of these guys obviously have bargaining power and leverage, et cetera, but that's something that you should look at because as we go through this list, None of these are, oh my God, I just saved 100000 You know, these are all small steps that add up to big things, big dollars. And the reason that's important is something that Curtis and I uh, presented on at the Urgent Care Association a little while back is that, you know, of every dollar of profit, say you sell your center for five or ten times profitability. You know, that's just, it's a little more complicated complex than that, but just for easy math. So if you sell it for five times and you find $50,000 worth of uh, profitability that you can squeeze out, that's $250,000. You know, and if you sold it for 10 times, just you do the math. It, it, it gets, you know, it grows, so it's important. You know, so look at your uh, staffing level and right size that. They're going to look at that. You know, do you have too many clinical personnel? Do you have a staff full of nurses doing what MAs can do? You know, you're a clinical operator. I'm just, 
you know, so I don't, I'm not going to get too far into that, but I've seen it over and over. Did a transaction, you know, I think they let, uh, they changed one or two of the nurses in this urgent care business, and they added a front office staff person. So they needed more people to interact with the patient, but they had more uh, staff than they thought uh, in the clinical side. So that was a change that they made right after, or actually during transition. So before the deal closed, they knew who was going to go with the new co. Um, look at your cost per minute and see if you can gain any efficiencies there. Um, you know, a lot of these centers, they, you know, will, while we want 15-minute wait time, some of them are at the hour wait time because there's so many patients coming into some of those centers. You know, it's retail medicine. Consumers want it right now without any lag in quality. You know, can you deliver less wait time, increased throughput, happier patients, more more uh, money to the center? Um, you also need to know what you're spending per item for for procedures or cases. Many centers don't track spending levels deeply enough, and as a result, there's profit loss. You know, there's also provider preferences. You know, that often costs the business a great deal. If provider is not thinking about reducing material costs. Uh, so look at that and make needed adjustments if you can. Um, they will maximize code, coding, billing, and collection. You know, we recommend that an audit be conducted and completed in order to see if you're leaving money on the table. It's happened. I've sold a center. They were probably leaving $150,000 on the table because they weren't billing this. Uh, after five on the weekend, after five on Friday in a weekend code and a couple other things. One was the um, the shot administration. So they're getting a couple of bucks for the shot, but they weren't billing the shot administration code, et cetera. Luckily, we we saw that or figured that out, and we were able to point that out to the buyers and negotiate a higher multiple, et cetera. But nonetheless, uh, if you don't know, then uh, the buyers not going to point that out to you. And if you have a uh, audit, the best thing that's going to, or the worst thing that can happen with that audit is they say, man, you guys are great. There's nothing uh, that I suggest changing. The, uh, the best thing is, whoa, wait a minute, look here what you're, what you're leaving on the table. And that all goes to profitability, right? And then you multiply that like we talked about before on the transaction. Um, look at your lease on the space. You know, renegotiate your lease if possible. You know, obviously, if you lower your expenses, you improve, in, uh, improve the profits. Uh, renegotiate vendor agreements. Renegotiate third-party insurance agreements. I just saw one that, that was done, and I think they got uh, 10 bucks on one, 12 on another, that type of stuff on the, um, on the urgent care contracts, fixed rate. Um, you know, if, if, if you're a platform, they'll ensure that your leadership team is up to the rapid expansion. And, and so you need to make sure that you have a good leadership team in place. Um, you know, those are just a uh, few examples of what uh, some of these guys will look for and what they'll do. Uh, Curtis, you have anything to add? Uh, not a pretty good answer. Um, we do have a question from the audience, which probably would fit in here. But, Blaine, um, what kind of issues have you seen or do you consider when the seller uses the cash basis method of accounting or the buyer uses the accrual basis method of accounting? Well, it obviously depends on the complexity of the transaction. I would tell you that the majority of the smaller, you know, the, uh, the mom and pop setups, you know, the one centers, two centers maybe, they all use a cash, uh, cash basis accounting. What you have to do and what they'll do is because Cash base accounting, and Curtis is the CPA, but uh, cash base accounting doesn't take into account uh, the the pay time off that's accrued, and and so there's a lot of things that it doesn't account for, and so what you'll have to do is just convert that. So that you'll either convert it in a pro forma, so they'll ask questions about, hey, what 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 PTO hasn't been. Uh, hasn't been put on the books and that's still out there. And the way that they sum that, the way that they take care of that is actually in the uh, documents to say that you're responsible for all of uh, paying all that out at closing. 
So they'll go and get a list of that type of stuff, and they will require you to pay for it before or at closing. It's not a big deal on the smaller transactions. As you get a little bit bigger, then they'll dig into it a little bit more. My personal opinion is that I believe that the buyers see a lot of inefficiencies in the smaller transactions, meaning where they can come in and say, oh, I can save money here, 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 and here, that they're less worried about it. Um, but again, as the, as the transaction size gets larger, it becomes a bigger issue, and we'll have to be more aggressive or more organized in how we do it and would have to convert, if not on an Excel spreadsheet, actually um, in, the, um, in the accounting software. Right, a couple on the cash basis versus the accrual basis. The other, the other things I, I see, I like to think of some stuff as like a modified cash basis that really uh, concerns me. For example, a entity might record a receivable on their balance sheet, but that receivable is at gross instead of net. And then you need to figure out, I mean, from the accounting side, uh, just kind of nerdy accounting stuff, every debit must have a credit, right? So if there's if there's a receivable, then that other side has to be somewhere probably in revenue, which means revenue might be overstated. Uh, so that needs to be figured out and, and cleaned up before any transaction. That, that could get pretty ugly if people are just recording receivables with, uh, at gross. Um, inventory is a little bit of a challenge, um, not with urgent care, I mean, there's not a huge inventory, so that's always that's always good with entities where there's a lot more inventory. It can be challenging because you're really going to want to see what the change in, in the inventory is year over year to make any adjustments to your supply costs. But if you don't have those counts on an annual basis, then you're really not able to make that, make that change. So it's always good, I think, just to do an inventory from an operational perspective and as you're going into a sale, you can say, okay, well, here's where the inventory was last year, even if it's not on your on your balance sheet. That is, Curtis, that will be part of the due diligence process. So, you know, it won't be necessarily early on because, like you said, uh, urgent care as far as the consumables isn't, um, you know, it's not like a surgery center or something that have implants or whatever. Um, but we would list out the um, the supplies or, or at least approximate, and then there will be a requirement, something along the lines that there's 30 days worth of supplies at the day of closing in the urgent care center, something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, next question, what are some of the typical red flags and how do I address them when preparing my urgent care business for a sale? And, and I think we've done a really good job uh, over the last 45 minutes uh, or more here talking about a lot of that um, with the red flags, such as threats and, and when to sell and, and stuff like that. I don't know, Blaine, did you have more that you wanted to add? Kind of yeah, because there's questions. a couple that, that are like big issues, big rocks, okay? That, that, that come up that I see more often in these transactions. One is uh, provider credentialing with payers. You know, say that you have a, a mid-level and, uh, you know, uh, they get paid something like their unsupervisor if the physician doesn't see the, uh, the patient. Their reimbursement for a lot of the payers is something like 85% uh, versus the physician's 100%. They're going to look at that and they're going to dig on that type of stuff. Um, having actual providers, having them locked up, having enough providers is a big issue. We, we, we've had some trouble in uh, one of the 200 times a deal dies, right, was about providers. And uh, they typically want the main physician provider, if that's the person that owns, to stay on. And, uh, and it's more critical well, it's, they won't do the deal if it's in a remote location and they have to go turn around and recruit a physician supervising provider. Same thing with PAs. You know, we've had some staffing issues in some of the uh, clinics 
we have to shore that up. And we get on that early because I know that's a big rock. Um, they'll, so, so they'll look at that. R regulatory issues, a, a big deal. Um, going through a little notes here. Um, remote location. You know, the further away your center is from one of the buyer's assets, the better organized and ran it has to be. Uh, you know, you need to have a good office manager that they feel comfortable with, et cetera. Uh, pending litigation, regulatory issues, lease expiring, uh, those types of things are, um, are, are some of the big deal. But the provider uh, and getting the scheduling and all that type of stuff will kill a deal. Um, so those are kind of the, the main things. Yes, and I really haven't seen an urgent care deal, but would probably come up. Uh, would be terms in terms of a real estate lease agreement. A lot of times physicians may put a entity, I mean, I've seen this come up in physician practices where they've rented space from a hospital, and as part of that there might be a right of first refusal or the ability to terminate the lease upon a sale. And that will come up, for example, if you want to bring in, you may rent in some medical office space that's owned by the hospital, may not be on the hospital's campus, but at the end of the day, you want to bring in another system as your partner for some reason. And if that happens, the hospital that you're leasing from may have the ability to just kick you out of the medical office space. And I, you know, obviously, with your location and stuff like that, that'll be challenging. Yeah, what I've seen in those is sometimes there's a first right of refusal type setup. You know, so what they don't want, so say you're in, you know, uh, Joe Blow General Hospital's medical office or a, a retail center that they own or whatnot, they don't want the competing hospital to come in and be able to s set down in that space. They typically won't have an issue, you know, selling to a national management company or buying to them, et cetera. And, and while that does it could hurt you a little bit in your ability to go out and create competition and leverage the competition against each other. That's why you have to make sure those things are worded just right in the sense that it covers what their issues are but does not, quote, unquote, cut your legs out from underneath you in the sense of um, uh, not being able to go out and create competition and, and be able to get uh, market rate or market dollars for your urgent care center whenever you, or if you do have an interest in selling. Just got to be careful. We have a, uh, a few questions here that are very similar, so I'm just going to kind of combine them together. But uh, Blaine, what does the buyer market look like in the next few years? And then what are multiples look like um, both now in the next few years for like a one center urgent care center, three, uh, like a company with three urgent care centers, and even a larger company that may have 10, 15 urgent care centers. Yeah, so uh, we touched on kind of the buyer market earlier, and I'll repeat that. But So I believe that uh, by the end of 2016, or around 2016, so it might be some six months, uh, give or take, at the end of 16, that the financial buyers that are interested in the smaller platforms, because you know, not to get in depth about the, what the profiles of the financial buyers, but you know, if you have an EBITDA of five million or, or, or better, you have the attention to everybody. And there's enough people that have enough interest in this space that they've dropped that down to if all the other items, the other important things are taken care of, they'll go down to a million dollars in EBITDA. So they don't want a one center that's making a million dollars in EBITDA because that's not a platform possibility, but they've dropped it down to those numbers. Well, those types of buyers, I believe they will have their full by 2016 or they'll be out because they'll, consolidation uh, is going to, it's speeding up now and it's going to speed up more over the next two years. So we believe that the, that the transaction multiples, you know, they're going to be good for the next couple of years. Uh, they will be uh, I say that they'll be great for the next couple of years, and they'll still be good after that. But the big deal is that debt is cheap and easy, and these larger companies are are uh, are being able to get money for cheap, 
And so we believe the next two years are going to be a very good time because I think we'll see the, 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 the largest number of buyers be in the market by that 2016 date. And that creates competition, which obviously drives up, drives up, drives up multiples. So let's talk about multiples for a second. And multiples are confusing because everybody wants to talk about multiples, right? And, and you'll hear a water cooler talk and, and you'll go say, Dr. Joe, I heard that you sold your chain of urgent care centers. What, did, what multiple did you sell them for, for? I promise you I won't tell anyone, right? And he says, I sold my chain of urgent care centers for a 15 multiple. And you're like, oh my God, you're going to tell everybody that one, right? And then you go to the buyer and said, hey, I heard that you bought Dr. Joe's chain of urgent care centers. How much did you buy them for? I bought them for a five multiple. Well, somebody's got to be lying, right? Well, no, neither one of them's lying. And this is a, you know, a fairly accurate example of a transaction that happened in the space. And what it is is that this business was making $2 million, and they sold it for, you know, I'm going to make these numbers up so they're not easy, can easily ID everybody. You know, sold it for $30 million. But after a year that the new company had it, you know, it did $7.5 million in EBITDA. It's because all the inefficiencies, so the 15 is, an, uh, is the buyer's multiple, the, the 5 is the seller's multiple, right? So what I'm saying is there, there's a big difference in that, but to get to your point uh, or answer the question that everybody always asks is, hey, what do these multiples look like? So I have never sold a uh, single urgent care center for less than a five multiple, one that's operating, okay? And I've, uh, I've sold them for as much as seven and a half multiple, okay? But let me define what that seven and a half. They were leaving a significant amount of money on the table, okay? They weren't billing enough. They weren't collecting everything, and it was a very attractive urgent care center that saw a lot of patients. Uh, but they were leaving money on the table. So we figured all that stuff out, and that's why the multiple goes up. You're seeing, you know, for these, you know, as you get multiple centers, if you get over three, you know, you're starting to get to the higher seven, you know, the higher of that, that range that I just gave you. When you start getting sizable platforms, I mean, those numbers have, uh, have, uh, have been – in the double digits uh, multiples. I mean, you know, 15s have been out there, but that's way out there for, you know, what I call the beauty queen, the valedictorian, and the all-American uh, athlete all in one. So that's the, the, the great of the great. Uh, and and the, the difference between those multiples is, is sometimes how close to the bone do you get? Well, the recast, so we talked about recasting, adjustments, all of those types of things. So the more aggressive that you try to argue uh, the adjustments, you know, you should give me credit for synergies, okay, for the liable synergies, meaning, hey, my costs are going to go, these costs are going to go down, as long as it's legal through the anti-kickback and Stark and all that stuff. And you make those arguments. Well, they might say, okay, we'll give you that. But then the multiple uh, comes down, so uh, you know that gives you a picture. But I also want to give you the backstory because people run around saying seven and a half, seven and a half, or or eight, or whatever. And it, you got to see the whole picture, and you got to see the terms of the agreement because you know we did a, a seven, seven and a half. They got to keep. Uh, they had to contribute no working capital, and they got to keep all the AR. Well, that's more than a seven and a half multiple. In, in a de compared to a deal that says, hey, you, uh, you know, you're going to get a seven multiple, but you have to give $170,000 worth of working capital at closing. So that means you have to put 170 into the new co, and you, uh, you can't keep AR. That's a huge difference. So that's why you have to, the devil's in the details. I hope that answered it. With that, that takes us to the end of our, our questions, and we're a little bit over our time, so I appreciate everyone sticking around and listening to the presentation and the roundtable today. Our contact information is up here. Also, this uh, presentation is being recorded, so it will be available for 
for download uh, in the next couple of weeks as well. Once again, appreciate everyone's time and thank you for attending uh, this session on buying and selling urgent care centers.